Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Nice Hour on Adobe Live. Uh, I'm Matt Alagaya. I'm the editor of It's Nice That, and I'm speaking to you from a very, very warm uh, London, <laughs> North London. So apologies if I've got a bit of a, a sheen for the rest of the, uh, the afternoon. Um, if you weren't with us last week, the Nice Hour is a series of advice-led events from It's Nice That hosted on Adobe Live, offering you the chance to receive some expert creative guidance from the industry's leading practitioners. Last week, my colleague Lucy spoke to the creative heavyweight Kate Moross about designing for music. Uh, welcome back, by the way, to anyone who joined last Monday, and uh, welcome to any regular Adobe Live viewers out there as well. Um, today, I'm really, really delighted to say I'm joined from New York by the designer and creative director, uh, Eric Hu. Um, good morning, Eric. Thanks very much for joining us so, uh, so bright and early over there. No, no, my pleasure. My pleasure. <laughs> Just gone 7 a.m. Um, how are things over there? Um, you know, they're, they're as good as it can be. Uh, my skincare routine is not cooperating with me this morning. Other than that, pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, that's good to hear. Um, so Eric and I will be with you for the next hour up until uh, 1 p.m. Uh, British Standard Time, obviously. Um, today, we're looking specifically at type design and the question of how you use typography in design projects in a really meaningful way. Um, it's kind of no exaggeration, really, to say that uh, very few people in the world are better qualified to talk on such matters than Eric. Um, I'm sure many of you in the audience will know this already, but uh, Eric used to be the Global Design Director at Nike. He was also uh, the Director of Design at Essence. Before, in 2014, he co-founded the studio Nothing In Common, which he then ran for two years. So over the course of the, his career, he's kind of reshaped numerous identities and become known for using typography in innovative and unexpected ways, we can say. Um, Eric, before we dive into the five portfolios that we've uh, we've been submitted and we're discussing today, just a quick question for you, really. Where do you think your own passion for, for type design and typography actually stems from? It's a really good question. Um, you know, I, I go back and forth a lot, whether it's it was something innate, um, but I, I do think it was shaped by my environment. Um, you know, I, I, grew up, I grew up in the suburbs of, of Los Angeles and you know, I, I've, I've, I've remembered, I've always just been obsessed with just seeing letters everywhere. Um, you know, just seeing like restaurant signage, uh, graffiti on the freeways in LA, which is like a big thing. Um, just even like my parents' signature as a kid. I, you know, I think typography is, is how we make language visible. And, you know, I, I grew up in a Chinese neighborhood, so I would just see like the beautiful like Chinese characters on the restaurant signage. Um, but, you know, being in LA, it was also like heavily multicultural. So just seeing just like different types of people, different types of cultures, different types of, um, you know, just like social groups and whatnot, like from punk bands to like, you know, like rap groups, all just really express themselves with the, the font they picked and and that was just always really interesting to me um i think it, one of the joys of language is is speaking and it's it's reading um and it, it's also writing but you know it doesn't really stop there it, i think like typography is a way to give writing and to give that language like a point of view that one sees before they could even like finish reading like an end of a sentence so that's just kind of just been a lifelong thing and i think like a lot of my peers, you know, they come up with the same way, just really just digesting in their outside environment, their love of books or, or whatnot. I think typography is just kind of a gateway from a lot of different hobbies. Like if you're starting a restaurant, you know, when it's time to do the menu, what does that look like? If you, if you and your high school friends form a garage band, like you're going to have to make flyers at a certain point. So there's just so many ways for people to enter into kind of, kind of the field from you know, outside practices. And that's what makes it interesting a lot of times. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, um, I mean, LA, in terms of kind of typography in the public realm, it feels like LA is just such an amazing city for that. I, I remember first going there and just being amazed by all the, all the signage everywhere. So I can totally see why that would be an inspiring place uh, to, to kind of start off in, in that in that sense. Um, yeah. Yeah. To give you guys a bit of a kind of heads up about the, the format today. So ahead of today's chat, we, we asked budding designers from It's Nice That's Audience um, to submit typography related creative projects for Eric to discuss and advise upon. And basically over the next hour, that's exactly what we're gonna be doing. We've got five portfolios to go through um, over the next hour. So we'll be spending around 10 minutes uh, discussing each. I'll also be asking any questions uh, that you have in the audience. So please feel free to submit these via Discord. Um, I'll be keeping an eye on the chat and um, yeah, I'll be kind of putting any questions that are in there to Eric over the course of the uh, 
the hour. Um, also, if you're watching this on YouTube, please then do join us over on Behance, in fact, because that's where you'll be able to submit your questions. Um, it's also worth saying that Eric and I will both be joining the Discord channel at the top of the hour uh, to answer any further questions that we don't have time to answer during this hour. So please do stick around after the event, say hello, and uh, continue the discussion over on Discord. Right, thank you very much for, for bearing with me, everyone, and uh, you included, Eric. Um, it's time for us to now have a look at our first portfolio um, of this hour. So I'm really, really excited to say that we've got uh, our first person is Alexander um, Znosko from, from Poland. And uh, Alexander runs his own studio in Warsaw. And we were basically really impressed when we saw his portfolio because it shows a really accomplished use of typography. Um, he submitted a selection of work rather than one specific project. Um, so I guess, Eric, kind of looking through um, Alexander's work, what were, you, what were your kind of first impressions, I guess, of that? I think... Um... I think Alexander has this really amazing command of scale and contrast. And, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, things are kind of the right size and that's a really hard, that's a really hard um, skill to pull off. It's, you know, I, I think, I think when you're starting out and doing typography and doing graphic design, um, you know, when you start off with like an empty poster or an empty book and you look at a canvas, you know, it, it like the, I think, I think one of the first things to do is to pick it. One of the first things and hardest things to do is to pick a typeface. Um, and the, I think the second hardest is like to know what size it is. And a lot of people do this out of like very practical reasons. Um, you know, if you're designing a book, you're limited in, in, you're limited in a scale and you, you know, it's designed to be read in front of here. So there's just, you can't really deviate far from like certain sizes. But I think when you're dealing with a poster, um, like a lot of Alexander's work, it, it gets different, right? Um, a poster should ideally look good across the street. But, you know, if you're walking on the sidewalk and the poster is, you know, less than a meter from you, um, you know, it, it should still be, it should still be readable. And, uh, and there should be just like more information as you look up close, right? And so, with those constraints, there's, you know, you get to play with large typography to be seen across the street, and you also get to play with small typography. Now, the difference in sizes that you use, I think that's really easy um, to get a little bit too ahead of yourself. Um, sometimes there's too many font sizes going on. Sometimes there's too many different typefaces. Um, what, what I, you know, I, I tend to do a lot is like I think about it in terms of contrast. If I have something small, I need to have something big next to it um to show just the size differences right it's not really small type if if all your type is small it's kind of just you know that's the baseline and it's not really big type if all your type is big um and so i think just like point simply like what alexander gets like he, he hits a nice sweet spot between um um just having the small typography and the large typography like integrate and dance together um now, I think uh, I think if I were to take this further, though, it it does. It's really great when it happens with type sizes, but um, it you know, I think in terms of the imagery, and I think with the first one, you know, there, there's Arabic typography I see in the center, but I think let's just call that the image for now. For um, the images often play a passive role. In the typography um you know i see like in this poster for example i just see like really nuanced and really tasteful like, kind of grid going on on the side of the borders and i think that's like really fascinating it's just really kind of a shame that the image just kind of just fits in a little bit it, it almost fits in a little bit too easy um you know there's really smart use of the grids but i think i think uh it kind of sticks to the grid a little bit too much. I think there were there were a couple in the previous slides. I don't know if you could go back to those, Matt, um, where yeah, there's course. like a larger sample of you know their work. Um, yeah, I think I think what I would what I would say is that you know grids should be a starting point. Um, they really shouldn't. I personally don't really find it that fulfilling when 
when I see a work of graphic design and it's all about the grid system that it's in. You know, it's just really part of the story. And I think, you know, grids should be empowering, um, but it shouldn't tell the whole story. Like, I think it's a little bit too easy for me to look at Alexander's work and I could literally with a pencil just kind of just draw a line to see where the structure and the grid is. And I think if, when it's a little bit too easy to do that, it, it loses some of the spark and some of the imagination. I think the best advice that I've ever gotten about typography came from a professor I had during my first year, Meryl Pollen. And she says, she said to me, like, you lay a grid when you're designing, design up to 80%. When you're about to be done, turn the grid off and just leave it up to your eye. That's when you start moving things around. Um, you know, you're not, you're not going to get points. I think in design, just start checking the boxes. I think, you know, it takes a lifetime of one's career to like really learn how to use a grid. But at the end of the day, it's, it's a really easy starting point is that you draw a couple straight lines and you make sure that the things you put down don't deviate from those lines. But just as inherently that provides a very useful structure, it's also inherently just not how good art or good design kind of arises you know it there has to be a feeling that an expectation was subverted and so you know i think a lot of the visual language here is like very contemporary i could tell that this you know this these works were made in the last five years um so it is a product of its time but you know i think we've been using grids um well we've been using grids in some form for hundreds of years but we've been using grids in the in the modernist sense um you know for for nearly a hundred years at this point. And I think like, you know, the challenge of making things line up um, in a straight line isn't, isn't that new. So I would say, you know, I, my advice to Alexander would be the same. Um, turn it off when you're about to be done. Um, you know, stand back from your work and squint a little bit and just, just go with your heart. Cause I think you're already pretty good at making making a structure for things. I think you want to just maybe throw a wrench in your own practice um, because design, interesting design really thrives on like asymmetry, especially. Um, and so, you know, I think you could do things like that. I, I think, I think if anything, you could try designing something without a grid and then just turn one on like later on. I think like you're good enough with the grid that you could kind of just bounce back from not using it at any point. And I think it's just going to lead to maybe more interesting work because you might go down paths that you might not go. Um, you know, it, it, if you think about it like driving, like get off the freeway for a second, you know, go off road. Um, mm. And it, it's not it's not going to be as it's not going to be as chaotic as you think it is. And it, and it might lead you to a path that, you know, you haven't explored. Um, so really, you know, I, think, I think in sorry. Alexander's own work, there's there's this there's this love for rationality, um, but there's also this need for spontaneity. And so I would say lean more to spontaneity because you're really good at the rationality already. That's fantastic advice. I think any any kind of budding designer listening would just be would be amazed by that. And I think there's such interesting things there in terms of yeah, just kind of breaking the mold a little bit. I mean, I guess one question I had was whether there are things that you ask yourself during a project to push your your work further. I mean, we've talked there about how you actually you know, you turn off the grid and and do things by by your eye a bit more. But are there also questions that you're asking yourself as you're going through a project that you're really kind of making sure that you're getting the most out of it? I think the, being a designer is hard. You know, I think when you, um, I, I think I think in a lot of creative endeavors, like I think the question a lot of people ask, like deep down their internal monologue, is that is this better than the last thing I've made? Am I breaking new ground? And I think I admittedly do ask that, but sometimes that is pretty antithetical to the to the goal of the design project. Um, you know, it's, I try to challenge myself and I try to make things interesting, but design as an inherently, like, you know, we say design is about problem solving all the time. Um, I, I think most jobs are about problem solving. Let's get that out of the way. But I think if you're trying to solve a problem for a client, sometimes it's maybe not fair um, to that client. Maybe sometimes like the answer to their question is really obvious. and. And uh, sometimes it doesn't need to be fussy. Um, and so you have to just reconcile that with your desire to maybe outdo yourself. I think like recently, the graphic design in a, rec in a couple of, in the last few years, it's felt like an arms race. Um, I think everyone, I think a lot of my contemporaries are designing, trying to impress their buddies um, in, a, in a way. And um, 
So I think it's really just about tapering it in. But if I maybe had to go back to that question and say like, you know, what are some things I ask myself is that one, is this, am I pushing myself? Am I challenging myself? Am I phoning it in or am I not? Um, what can I do that's different? Sometimes I'll, sometimes I've designed things where it's like, it happened really quick and it was very smooth and I know it's what the client's liked. And I'm, I've like just selfishly been like, I'm not going to show that to the client. It's almost like just too appropriate. Um, and I, I kind of just start over because it's like, if I'm, I, I feel like if I'm not comfortable with how it looks at the end, I feel like I'm going in the right direction. If I'm a little bit too comfortable and I think this is like a successful design, it probably isn't. And it probably means that, you know, I'm, I've gotten maybe perhaps a bit complacent, but I always try to temper that with like, is this what the client needs? Because I think when you try to push yourself and you leave that a little bit unchecked, um, you may lose sight on a couple of obvious things. And so right. it's really just about pushing and pulling, um, you know, the two forces, like, is this appropriate and is this enough? And those two kind of questions, um, kind of constantly you know, in balance kind of they? swirl around it. <laughs> Great. Um, we're going to have to leave it there, Eric, and then move on to, to portfolio number number two. But thank you so much for that. And um, Alexander, I hope that was that was helpful. And anyone else watching, I hope that was also helpful. Um, our second creative is India Tupe, um, who's based between Paris and London and who just graduated from Central St. Martins in London as well. Um, her design practice is really broad, covering everything from photography and writing to typography and layout design. Um, she mentioned she's keen to learn more about branding and visual identity work as well when she uh, submitted her portfolio. Um, Eric, I guess now that she's graduated, um, what would you suggest she maybe starts reading or experimenting with um, possibly someone's work to check out for the, for the method of thinking, particularly when it comes to that branding and visual identity work that she says she's um, particularly interested in kind of pursuing in future? Yeah. Um, yeah. First off, India, congratulations. Um, you know, I, not everyone knows this, but I, I briefly um, also studied at St. Martin's in the in the BA Honors Graphic Design program, so lots of fond memories there. Um, you know, I think um, you know looking back, the program was like very influential to me, and it really taught me how to ask questions. Um, you know, maybe it's different now, but there's less of an emphasis there on really hard technical skills and more of an emphasis on you know asking the right questions. Um, you know, having a curious mind. And, and thinking about the world and having that lens in a different way. And, um, you know, I, I think I think with India, I think with your work and your book design, um, you weave together an interesting point of view. Um, you know, you've created, you know, book design a lot of times is, is like world building. You created a very self-contained kind of universe, um, you know, as a tangible object. Um, and, there's a lot of abstract and kind of narrative storytelling. I think, um, I think the one sort of advice that I would maybe give is, is, you know, as, as you're starting out, um, to, to maybe try, I think it's almost, uh, I think almost like there's the opposite. Um, I would give the opposite advice to Alexander, the previous person. I would say like, you know, there's this beautiful point of view and there's this beautiful way to express and there's just say a sentence in a lot of these works. And, and, um, but you know, if you're interested in branding, you have to understand how to, when to say something in a very straightforward and matter of fact way, you know, I think, um, I think when you look at, you know, the spread in the top, right. Um, you know, I, it tells a story, you know, it, across an entire spread. And you have one sentence up here and one sentence down there, and it goes to the, the next page. I think it's really understanding that, like, that's not necessarily appropriate for every situation. Um, sometimes something just needs to be big and bold. And so, you know, typography is like a voice. Um, you could, you know, it's your voice, right? But you could yell and you could whisper and you could sing and you could just, you know, speak in a matter of fact way you could be cheeky and you you know could be serious and there's a lot of emotions you can modulate it's still your voice and it's going to be you and no one's going to take that from you and what you say 
is still going to be you. But there's so many ways to express the same sentence over and over again. And when I see India's work, it's like, you know, there's a lot of nice use of black and white, small, really tasteful typography, typography that moves and it's dynamic. I would say get out of your comfort zone. Um, and that's my advice to everybody, right? Um, when I look at your portfolio, um, I'm just like, I wonder what would happen if India, you know, just force themselves to use like 472 point type, you know, or to just say one word on a piece of paper um, and just make it as big as possible. I wonder what happens if, you know, there's a lot more use of color. And if this is the path you want to take, I think that's great. But again, this is advice specifically if you're interested in a world of branding. Sometimes things just have to be expressed in black and white. You know, sometimes things just have to be understood like, like that. And there's not necessarily, you don't necessarily control the context in which someone views your work. And so you don't necessarily control their attention. I think um, ty I, when, I, when I think about it, typography a lot of times is the art of directing um, visual attention. I think graphic design is like how you direct someone's attention, where they look, you know, how they look, how long they look. And it's not exactly a hard science by any measure, um, but there's a lot of things you could do. And I think um, this is work that's being made for a certain type of audience in mind. And a person, there's a lot of, there's a lot of care being made into the work, but it, it, it kind of assumes that I'm going to be coming at it from a very peaceful place and I'm going to spend enough time with it. And, you know, there's plenty of people like that too, but I think, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge to try to make work for a different type of audience. Someone that maybe doesn't have the same amount of attention span, someone that maybe only gets like two seconds with your work. And so I think, um, you know, experiment more, more with contrast. There's a lot of things right now, like the typography is like one size. Um, you know, there's plenty of negative space, uh, you know, go against that for a second and just maybe see what happens. That's such a, it's such an interesting idea that, you know, that kind of the difference, I guess, between book design and branding, you know, the amount of time that someone's coming to your work with, um, yeah. it's just, yeah, it's, it's so interesting to hear. Um, this book project, which I guess we've touched on already is, is, um, called of ice and tears. And it's a, it was, uh, India's final, um, major project from her, from her degree. Um, it's a kind of, it's an ode to, and a, and a response to ecological tragedy. Um, and she says experience as a meditation on modesty between the retreating glacier and ourselves. Um, so a really powerful, important kind of piece of work. Um, I guess just looking at the the idea of meditation and wanting to slow the reader down um, using graphic design, as you mentioned, are there any other ways you can do that? I mean, are there any other ways you can kind of communicate that idea of meditation and slowing down? Um, or do you think this this project actually does that really well already? I think the project does that really well, but maybe in too much of an expected way. I think the I think when you're publicly speaking, um, the quickest way to get someone to listen to you is to start speaking slowly. Mm -hmm. And so I think you just see a visual representation of that, um, you know, speak slowly and in a low voice. And this is what the typography is doing. But again, you could also get someone's med like attention by just yelling. Um, but I think like, I think if you think about meditation, you know, what that means and in that meditative state, it's really about you know, clearing one person's mind and just being present and being there now. And, you know, there's, there may be other ways to, to go about that. But I think like, you know, if there's maybe a concern that your work doesn't resonate enough with, I think, different studios or different people, um, I think this is where it's hard because it is, it is work that you have to be in a specific mindset to get into. And I think if you want your work to resonate with more people, um, it's worth diversifying things. And I, and again, this is, I'm only saying that because this is, you, you know, India is a recent graduate and you're at the specific point in your career. Um, you know, some people might have a predefined style and I would just say like, maybe come to that decision or maybe decide like you have a thing, like maybe give yourself a little bit of time before you say that. I think there's maybe a little bit too many recent graduates who think they have a style and they think they have in. I don't think anyone truly knows what they want to do when they're 22. And that is such an unfortunate kind of pair of handcuffs to give yourself. Um, and I think like as, as a di designer specifically, you know, I think someone should try a bunch of different things before they land on it. And, it's, and it seems like India, you know, does that, you know, she does have 
Uh, and sorry, I don't mean to assume anyone's pronouns, by the way. Um, so please correct me if I'm wrong. But India does have, um, you know, this appetite for exploring different things. There's a, there's a, you know, use of photography. There's a use of craft. There's a use of, you know, actual graphic design. Um, and there's a lot of different kind of interests being played at heart. But again, it's all being kind of collaged and put together for a very specific point of view. And so, you know, if I okay sorry i think i just had a little technical difficulty but i think it's okay um we can still think, see it. Hey. okay great you know it's, it's like if i if a quiet person wants to get more social i would say socialize more um you know and if, if an extroverted person wanted to learn how to be a better listener i would say speak less so again the advice is very you know person-centric and it's very specific to a particular person but it's always falls under the same thing like really get out of your comfort zone um seek you know challenge yourself just throw a wrench if, if something comes a little bit too naturally or too easy like constrain yourself maybe add a maybe add another restriction or just try to do something in in a way that you haven't done before so. fantastic yeah i mean in, in her application or her submission rather india did mention um the fact that she was kind of curious to see how um she could make her work kind of more approachable um, and I guess, yeah, connect more with, with other practitioners and, and other studios as well. Um, so I think that was really excellent advice there um, from Eric. So thank you for that. And um, we're going to have to move on to our, our, another portfolio, our third of this edition of the Nice Hour on, on Adobe Live. Um, so next up is Mohamed Fawal, a graphic design student in Germany, another student um, who's making some really impressive work uh, for someone kind of so early on uh, in his career, which is fantastic. Um, I guess first of all, uh, Eric. Yeah, what did you what did you make of um, of Mohammed's uh, portfolio? I think Mohammed Mohammed is able to really synthesize a bunch of different um, a bunch of different visual languages from other sources, other cultures, and just kind of merge them in a in a way that's like very contemporary and a, and very much a response from now. I think. Um, you know, I, I think when I see Muhammad's work, I think there's a there's a lot going on, um, and so that might be, you know, and a lot of it's like very, a lot of it's very contemporary. Um, I, I think, uh, I think again, sometimes I, I think if something comes a little bit too easy, um, maybe question that. Uh, I, I see a lot of moves um, that are very personal, but they're also maybe. You know, a lot of things look like a couple things out there. I don't think there's really a nice, I don't think there's really a way to to word that differently and not try to communicate that. Um, you know, I, I see I see this amazing appetite to really try to tell a story in, in, in a really strong visual way, but I would say that it's a bit too fussy. There's a bit too much going on. And I think, you know, with projects like this, the subject matter is really important and there's sometimes I think now I, I, I think it's really hard design students and just designers in general now because, you know, the conditions that we have to design in, the actual objects we make like books, posters, websites, you know, they're all a very certain size. But I feel a lot of times people are designing more and more for Instagram and it, you know, it's a big challenge to try to make something that is attention grabbing in a little square. And that causes maybe the algorithm in Instagram and the explore page, or just maybe some of our decision makings to, to really try to grab someone's attention in that scroll. And I'm not saying that's what Muhammad is doing, but I think like a lot of the, a lot of, a lot of Muhammad's work looks really good. Um, as, as like a little thumbnail as like an Instagram thing. But I would say that, you know, trying to imagine this as an actual book, um, a lot of times I don't really know where to look. And a lot of times it's like, there's a lot of typeface changes. There's a lot of things um, sort of going on. There's, you know, there's Japanese characters here and there. There's, there's, um, you know, there's Arabic. There's, 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 there's very much this need to like, just try to um, take things up and just post things together. And I would say that like, you know, Again, it, it seems like I'm just giving contradictory advice depending on the person, but it's really just about tempering certain things. I see, you know, I, I see, I see 
it, a lot of the work feels like it's like very jumpy to me. Like there's, there's, it's like, I got to do this. I got to make this big. I got to have this black and white photo. I got to have this cool font. No, no. How about we have like two cool fonts and, um, you know, slow it down a little bit. Think about what you want to say and just know when to, know when to stop. I think, I, and I think, um, you know, challenge yourself a little bit. I would say like the next thing you do, try to say, I'm going to keep it at two typefaces. I'm going to keep it at two type sizes because when you place a restriction on that, you're going to focus a lot on composition. And so composition is really important in typography. It's like where you place things and how you, how big you place them. There's a lot of interesting things going on, but the actual compositions themselves are very straightforward. I think if you look at this spread, it's like, there's something on the left and it fills up the entire space. And then there's something on the right. There's a little bit too much symmetry going on. You know, the scale, everything is big. And then there's just this one thing going across. Um, you know, it makes the layouts a little bit stiff. I think, um, you know, if, if you have like an empty piece of paper um, and there's nothing there, and you just put one stain on that empty piece of paper, like you just get a pen and you just draw one dot, your eye immediately goes to that dot. It doesn't matter how big that dot is. It doesn't even matter where, because that dot is the only thing on this blank piece of paper, it commands like a viewer's attention hundred percent. And I think the more things you add on a piece of paper, it might be good visual eye candy at a certain place, but then you kind of run into this thing where if everything seems equally important on a piece of paper, like nothing's really important. And I think that's what's kind of going on in a lot of Muhammad's work. It's that like, I don't know, I don't know where to, where to really start with it a lot of times. And, you know, it's try to try to think more about composition, try to think more about layout. I think like, you know, I think a lot of the work, the work is like very, just like center aligned, you know, dead center, or it's like, blown up 100 percent or it's completely symmetrical i think look at the paragraphs like the, the the small paragraph types like it's justified it just kind of i think when you're adding a lot of texture you maybe get to be a little bit you don't really try to push the composition a lot more and so i would say like use a little bit less and think about the placement and arrangement and the scale of what you use um and, and practice honing that muscle because you're going to run into situations where you don't really have that much to work with. Like, you know, I, you know, I, I, I had that tendency too. like, I, 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 sometimes it's like, again, in this age of Instagram, you think you're not doing enough. And then we have a couple of contemporaries that are famous for pouring everything on a page. But I think like, that's what designers are doing in general these days. And I think, I think today's audiences are getting a little bit fatigued by just maximalist overload, you know, and, and so I'm guilty of this too, but I know that if you give me Times New Roman and say I have to set something in 12 point type, I know I could kick anybody's ass with that, you know? And I know that because I've designed under those like handcuffs and I'm comfortable with it. And, you know, it's like, however, however much information you give me and however much restrictions I have to use, like if I have, if I'm stuck with a bad font, it's like a lot of times people depend on using like a cool font to do all of the work that they're doing. And, um, you know, that's, that's really not, fair or kind to or, or confident in your own abilities you know like if you got stuck using a typeface that you didn't like like typography is about you know kerning and arranging and the size of that using it to like to overcome that kind of hurdle you know it's like you like a good typographer can make a bad typeface look amazing and it's like and a lot of the times it's like this is really cool, but it's cool because the illustrations are cool. It's cool because the subject matter is cool. It's cool because the typefaces are cool. And that's kind of just a general comment to student work in general, is that the source material, it's a little bit almost too easy. And that's a little bit, sometimes it's easy to tell what's a student project and what's not, is that the conditions are almost too good. And and I think like, you know, that that's not anybody's fault in particular, but I, I really think that, you know, one has to prepare for the situation where they're not gonna get ideal and the most optimal conditions to thrive. But those things could be used as interesting springboards into kind of new territory, you know? Um, and so, yeah. yeah, I would say just in this case, I would say try to do more with less, um, you know, take a step back a little bit. You know, not everything has to be so, um, you know, so loud and so attention grabbing, because if there's a, if there's a lot of things trying to grab your attention, 
you know, that viewer is not really going to give that full attention to anything in particular. And so really try to use that to your advantage. Like, yeah. No, that, 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 that's great advice. Yeah. I think um, my German's not very, it's a bit rusty, but I think this, this, the title of this book is The Lebanon, um, Me and Hybrid Identities. Um, and it's a book that deals with you know, the relationship between his home country, Muhammad's home country and himself. It looks at Lebanon and his parents' flight from the country and himself and younger migrants in Germany and their balance between two cultures. Um, so really, really interesting. Um, and I guess like a couple of projects we've seen already, um, they're personal projects, you know, they're really personal subjects. Yeah. Do you have any advice on how to make a personal project that also strikes a balance with a with a wider audience? And um, I'm afraid we've only got a couple of minutes on this question as well. Sorry. Yeah. You know that that comes to, you know, sometimes a personal story is just so important that it matters a lot less about, you know, it, it matters a lot less about trying to modulate your tone, um, you know. And I and I think like migration and that story especially as, as someone myself who has immigrant parents, um, you know, a lot of people are going to try to tell your story for you. And this is maybe just what I'm guilty of right now. And I think like, you know, th if it's a personal project, that's, that's really up to you and how you tell your story. But at the same time, you know, I think any good storyteller also tries to understand their audience. So when I talk about my kind of you know, my migration story, me growing up, you know, first generation, if I'm talking to a group of like, like-minded people that maybe, have, you know, other Asian Americans in my instance, you know, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't use the same kind of storytelling techniques as I would um, to somebody not with that background. And, uh, you know, again, like every storyteller, when you're telling a story, you might edit a couple details out. Like, I think we've all known that one friend, you know, at the pub that wants to tell a story and, you know, it's not always captivating and maybe they focus a little bit too much on the details and they go on and on and you don't really know where this is going. And then you got maybe a storyteller friend that really makes you feel like you're there. And again, I think those things are maybe, it's not worth thinking about if that's not what you do and you're telling a very personal story. I think any kind hearted person will want to sit and listen. And if not, that's maybe not who you want to tell a story to anyways. But if you want to get in the business of storytelling, you know, that's when it gets important. And I think graphic design counts as that business of storytelling. If you want to get in the business of expressing thoughts, um, you know, I think try to modulate your voice a little bit. I think a lot of the work right now is really responding to a lot of contemporary trends. And so that almost does a, a bit of a disservice to the story. I think if you're telling about the story of, you know, Lebanon and Germany and just what what you left and what you adopted and what you know still stays with you um you know i i really hope that there's a bit more of a personal touch in here i think like i think i think people could really benefit from that and i and i know like and i know this like muhammad's story is bigger than you know the graphic design trends of now and so i think it's 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 not wrong to to make work that is a response to the time now um but i think like i think this is one way where i would try to challenge it i think you know a lot of people could use a 3d rendering of barbed wire but not everyone has muhammad's story and so it shouldn't you know i, I think that should just be like a really important thing to think about not everyone has your story but a lot of people could do you know i think some of the things you're, you're doing on, on a, on a, on a single spread. And so, you know, I don't mean this as like really just like a, a harsh critique or anything. I think again, like, you know, trends are okay. I think it's okay to just make work that speaks to the language of now, but really like know when you're no, know where kind of you begin and where, you know, the things you're reacting to are ending and, and try to negotiate that a little bit more. I think that's fantastic. And yeah, I'm sure, you know, we, we obviously said at the beginning, but Mohammed is a is a student, so still lots to learn, but um, some really exciting kind of potential here, definitely. Um, it's also worth saying that, Mohammed, we, we kind of, yeah, our thoughts go out to, to you and your family in, yeah. in Beirut and, and across Lebanon, um, obviously with the horrific um, explosion that happened last week. Um, I'm afraid it's time we have to move on to our to our fourth um, portfolio now, Eric. Um, so this is uh, Mikalas uh, Saulitis, a practicing graphic designer with a deep interest in type based in Lithuania. Um, Eric, I guess this is one of those submissions that really already shows huge skill in typography. Um, 
What did you think of, of Nicholas's uh, type designs, in particular this this uh, fatso? It's called <laughs> this typeface. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, he was he was kind of very keen to to hear your kind of constructive criticism, I guess, to push his work a bit further. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm on one hand, I'm really glad that uh, Michaelis has reached out. On the other hand, I'm pretty confused because, you know, I, I'm I'm already a big fan of Michaelis's work. I, I follow Michaelis on Instagram. I'm pretty captivated by it. I, I definitely love Fatso. I would absolutely use Fatso in a project. So I don't really know what advice could give. I, you know, I think <laughs> in a lot of ways, like M Michaelis's type design is better than my type design, um, certainly. But I think, um, you know, and this might be just a little bit type design specific. I would say that, you know, the, the tools you use inform the marks you make. Um, and, you know, I think sometimes, you know, there's a lot of different softwares to really choose from in, in, in type of typeface design. Um, and each one has their affordances and limitations. I would just say like, maybe there's, I think sometimes maybe there's like, it's very clear that Michaelis's work starts from a geometric place. Like it's built on circles and squares and lines and shapes. And, and I think the software that Michaelis uses like, um, really kind of encourages that behavior. Um, there's this other typeface design software, you know, that other people might use where there isn't a circle tool and there isn't a square tool. Um, and, and the reason it was made that way is because, you know, one of the people that designed the software said, my circle isn't your circle. And it, it sounds like kind of a weird thing to say, but like, you know, it's, when Adobe, when, when, when Adobe, when you're designing an Illustrator, when you're designing an InDesign, you know, there are already tools, you know, at your disposal. There's like a rectangle, you know, there's a, a star shape, there's a square, there's, there's ready to know vector forms. You know, when you're in Photoshop, you know, there's blending modes, there's like drop shadow, there's, um, you know, there's bevel and emboss. There's a lot of tools you can use, but when you use those in their default settings, um, you know, it, it starts looking like the software in a bit way. And the thing to do as a designer that wants to get out of things is that you don't, you don't try to rely on these like presets a lot. Um, you try to come at things from a different way. Um, and so I would just say like, maybe start from a less geometric place because, you know, there's centuries of typographic tradition that wasn't based on drawing a perfect circle and drawing a perfect square and like fitting thing, letters in a grid. A lot of it really comes from the tradition of calligraphy and a pen and it's a very you know, there's proportions and there's spacing and there's rules that play in a place in that, but it's really about just really the flow of the hand. And so I think what might be an interesting place to start from is to really start maybe from a calligraphic standpoint, if Michaelis wants to push their work in a, in a different direction or wants to see things, I think. Um, but, you know, I think when I see Fatso itself, it, it's really great. You know, I love the contrast between, you know, the organic curve shapes and I love the contrast between like the straight shapes. The only thing is, is that, you know, it, is it these these are very geometric shapes and i think within fatso within that universe you don't want to have too many ideas in a single typeface you know um you really want to have one or two ideas and, and really express those two ideas and i think you know with fatso it's like um you know those two ideas are kind of there it's just like you know straight versus curve curvature you know geometric versus not um but yeah, I think like, try not, I would say if you were to draw a typeface again, try not to use a rectangle tool, try not to use a circle, just really just start with a pen tool and just kind of start from there. Um, because I think that, you know, you're competent enough that you don't really need those things. And um, so you don't really need these kind of handcuffs to, to really try to get in the way. Um, if you start from a place of geometry and from grids, it's it's going to look like it's a geometric typeface that's in a grid. And so, right. um, you know, spacing and, and proportions, those things are a lot more precise in typeface design than it is in like typographic graphic or layout design. Um, a lot of things are, are dependent on optical illusions. And, and Michaelis is very aware of that, really. The eye is the is the ultimate barometer in the future. It's not it's not getting it's not making sure that something is like a specific length, like you know, this line is exactly like one centimeter and this line is exactly two, one centimeter and the spacing between that is one centimeter apart. 
you could tell as a viewer, your eye could tell that, and it can't at the same time, you know? Um, and so really just try to tease into that, that kind of space between what's, what, you know, what's, what's graded and what's not, I would say. That's great. No, yeah, I think, I think great advice for, for Mikolas and yeah, obviously a very talented uh, designer goes yeah, without saying. Incredibly talented, yeah. Um, I guess, I mean, when you're looking for, when you're deciding which typeface you'll use for a project and in a project, um, I guess like what are the things that you're you're asking yourself? What are the questions you're asking? You know, how could Mikolas maybe make his work appealing to a graphic designer to use in their, in their work in a, in a different way? And, you know, we could, we could talk about Fatso, but we could talk about other kind of a bit more generally as well. And yeah. Also, before, sorry, Eric, before you answer that, it's also worth saying, um, guys, if you have any questions uh, on the Behance chat, do put them in there and I'll, I'll get them asked as well. Um, so yeah, don't forget about that. Sorry, Eric, over to you. <laughs> yeah, you know, typeface design and just like regular, like, you know, graphic design, like a lot of times they're diametrically opposed because what would be a, what, what would make a great brief in typeface design isn't necessarily gonna result in a typefaces that, that graphic designers use. Um, I think ultimately, like, I think in the last, in the last decade, there's been just been this revival and this love for display typefaces, but we have to, you know, for someone like me, who's a little bit old and kind of just been in, who's seen kind of just like generations kind of move and shift in graphic design a long time. It wasn't always the case. Like, you know, I think at the beginning of the previous decade, there's definitely less of a love of display faces as now. And, you know, things were just you know, very simple geometric sans serifs and whatnot. And you kind of see the tech world, they're still they're a couple of years behind in the rest of like contemporary graphic design discourse, but you know, that's kind of where they are now. And so I think the, I think you could think about typefaces and how opinionated they are. I don't want to say neutral and not neutral. When you talk about typography, I don't think there's any such thing. I say opinionated or not opinionated. And Fatso is very opinionated, you know, um, and I think about, I think about like Bob Gill, um, you know, he was one of the founding members of Fletcher Forbes Gill with Alan Fletcher, who, you know, people might be familiar with. And that studio eventually became Pentagram. And he was always like, he would say something like, if you have an interesting word, um, the example he used was the F word. You don't really need to use a crazy typeface to express that. It's already such a strong word that you can set that in Times New Roman and it's actually more powerful. Now, if you have like boring content, you want to dress that up in a more outlandish typeface. It, it's really not good when you have really interesting content and then you try to use a, a loud typeface, then it, it's just a little bit too much and it's, it, it's a lot of noise. And so I think like the more kind of display or opinionated a typeface might be, you kind of limit the kind of content there is. Um, but then as a typeface designer, maybe that's not interesting to try to make a Helvetica or a circular kind of clone. And so that's kind of just the eternal question is that what makes typeface designers fulfilled and doing interesting typefaces might not be what their clients need and their clients being graphic designers. Um, cause you know, typefaces cost money. And so if I'm spending money on a typeface, I'm, I need to know that I could use it in as many different projects as possible. Um, or at least that's part of what informs my decision. And so, um, you know, I, that informs it. So, you know, I think that's like maybe something to keep in mind. Yes or no, you know, I mean, I, th I think you could do what you want. Like, I think there's people, there's plenty of people that will use Fatso as a face. I think that's just the one thing. It's like, if you use the display type face, it's like, it's going to be out. And I think people get tired of the display faces, like being out and used a lot a lot more than just like non-display or like less opinionated typefaces. I think what goes in my mind when I'm designing for a project, I think one is it is it appropriate for the for the context? And that's a very subjective thing. Like, but it's like, you know, I, I might not use Fatso uh, in a book about in a book about, you know, the Northern Renaissance, for example. And I might use it for a flyer for my friends for my friend's band, if anything. Um, but other things are also just like practical cases, like, you know, can I use this in different cases? Um, you know, can I space it differently? Um, is it, is the typeface just kind of good out of the box or do I have to tease it a lot more? Is right. there enough characters that I need? The punctuation is, are there things there? Um, but I think the hardest question to answer is just like, is this the right typeface? And I think everyone comes through a different process with that. Yeah. Um, but I think, 
the more opinionated typeface, maybe the less room you leave for a designer to put their own mark on it, you know? And so it's really about when you're designing a typeface, it's knowing like when to make something like very distinctive in the typeface, but also when to maybe like tone that thing down so that it could be used in a bit more kind of a si situations. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah there's some displays like typefaces that are so complex that you could only really typeset it at a certain size and at a, a very simple layout before. And so, you know, th there's always a use case for any typeface, um, just like there's always going to be people that want to listen to a specific type of music. But yeah, if you're trying to make something just have a little bit more mileage, just like maybe kind of negotiate that a little bit more. Fantastic. Yeah. Great advice for any any typeface designers out there. Um, we've got to move on to our final portfolio, but um, there's a question that's come through from Sandrine, um, which I think is in kind of view of what you were saying about getting rid of the the kind of the, the, the tools, too many tools in the software. Um, Sandrine asks, would you always design a typeface by hand first in a notebook and then kind of go digital or um, would you kind of start with with those tools in the software? I'm really bad at drawing, so, you know, I think sometimes maybe there's a, I don't think you could really downplay the importance of, of how you sketch. I think sketching is important, but everyone sketches differently and it doesn't have to be a drawing. Um, you know, when I, when I first try to sketch a layout, I, I open up Adobe Illustrator, you know, and I just start playing with just like, with just like black boxes and like, you know, and just move these black boxes around to get in a composition I want. You know, that's like my sketching. Um, and then I replace that black box with a block of type or with a photo. Um, and so I think sketching is important. I don't think you should, I don't think you necessarily have to start by hand. I think definitely not. A lot of typeface designers actually don't draw on paper. They kind of just go right. into the shapes because, you know, um, a lot of times what I'll do is that I'll, what I'll do when I, when I'm, when I'm, I'll start drawing when I'm stuck on something. Um, if, if a typeface I'm working on or a logo is, doesn't look right, um, I'll, you know, I'll take a screenshot of it and then I'll airdrop it to my iPad and then I'll draw on top of it and then I'll send it back to my vector software and like trace what I, I drew because that kind of lets me, allows me to commit to ideas like faster and on paper. Um, but a lot of typeface design, a lot of typography is more, is closer to sculpting than it is drawing, um, you know. A lot of times it's like when you're working on a typeface, actually, you're manipulating a shape that's already there. You're like making a curve more steep. You're adding a little bit more curves. You're pulling things out. You're pushing it. it it's not exactly the same as drawing. But where drawing helps in typeface design is that, you know, where is knowing where things are thick and thin. Um, I think if you look at a typeface like Garamond or Times New Roman, you know, where it gets thin and where it gets thick, um, those are intentional places and it comes from the tools that they were used. Like, you know, those things were used when people use like a broad nip and flat pen and calligraphers held the pen at a 30 degree angle. And so when they drew kind of the letter A, where it got thick is where you would expect it to get thick while using that tool. And right. so I think it's important to know how a pen works and to know how you know, a like a calligraphic pen works and, it, and it's good to draw to get a sense of how, how having a feel of the letter forms in general. But I think once you understand more or less like the nature of the tools that you're working with, you don't really need to start on paper. There's nothing that says you have to, I think like, right. yeah, you should, you should sketch in the way that makes you comfortable, that makes you get the ideas out. And that might not necessarily be drawing, you know, as important as drawing is, it's maybe not necessarily how you commit to ideas quickly. So I know designers that write, like a paragraph or just get their thoughts written down on paper as a way to think about design. And that's how they sketch, you know? Uh, and so sketching is important. Drawing might be a way to sketch. It's not the only way to sketch. Great, great advice. Yeah, thank you. Um, we've got to move on, unfortunately, to our fifth and final portfolio of uh, this nice hour on Adobe Live. Um, our final portfolio today is by Rulan uh, G, a graphic designer based in the Netherlands. Her work is super varied and feels very representative of Quite a lot of work that young graphic designers are looking to make currently, um, Eric, I'm sure you'll agree. Um, what did you make of her portfolio? I'll just flick through um, these, these images while you talk. So uh, Roland, she, um, I think, uh, I think the use of color is really nice. Um, 
it's 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 very sparse but it's very effective um you know i think when you look at the piece on the left it's it's mostly gray but that flash of orange is really popping out i think when you look at the piece on the right mo again mostly gray and then there's just this fluorescent color um that kind of really draws your attention i would say that maybe it's a little bit too over reliant on using color to tell a story um you know i think contrast is good in general if you have something big show something small next to it. If you have something that's mostly monotone, have a bright color to pop that out. But I think like fluorescent is a little bit, you know, it's a little bit too easy sometimes. Like I think by nature, they're gonna be the loudest color in the space. And that's kind of where you go for that. I would say just try to experiment with more pastels and try to get a just different range of color. Um, I would say what maybe Roland could focus on is is um, is composition. Um, you know, I think I think there's I think there's a lot of potential. Um, I think when you look at some of the typographic spreads on on the right side, there's it, it really comes out when it comes to like the book typography. There's beautiful use of white space. Uh, there's a beautiful use of asymmetry. It's not like things are being mirrored. Uh, and I wish I saw that more in, in the poster work because in, in the poster work, a lot of things are just very like, it's huge and in the center and it's just really kind of static like that. Um, and so really try to just incorporate, I think like negative space in your work. I think a lot of the poster work is really concerned with just filling up all the spaces possible, you know? And like, there's not really just like empty space to really kind of rest your eye. And, um, and, you know, there's nice use of scale. Like, you know, again, there's large things next to small things, but again, it just kind of just fills up all the space a little bit too neatly. And I think my advice is the same thing as I've said before. It's not always the most interesting design when you just kind of fill things up and check the boxes. It's like, yeah, it's a slam dunk, but you know, where's, where's, the, where's, where's the conflict? You know, where's the romance? Where's the argument? And maybe it's silly to use those kind of words to frame composition like that, but you really have to think of it that way sometimes. It's like, um, you know, because that's also a point of contrast. I think like, again, it's like things kind of just fit a little bit too neatly in. And um, what I try to do when I make a poster sometimes is like try to challenge myself. Like uh, my tendency, that's my kind of natural tendency is like, I, I really like when things um, fit, but I try to give myself like a little bit of a challenge. Like I'm going to set the headline like unnecessarily obnoxiously large. <laughs> um, no matter the content i'm going to try to just like see i'm going to try to see how everything else like fits around that and i think that's like you know i, I use that as a challenge um to really just try to you know tip the tip the scale over and making things difficult i think like um you know so i would say like if i had to do the middle poster again like where it's like i, I think it's like these like circular objects i'm assuming they're coins it's like the coins are the biggest thing there and like there's little type dancing around it. I would maybe try to flip that, try to make the typeface the size of those coins and try to make those coins a little bit small and see what you kind of get out of that. Again, I think it's just like, you know, the, the negative space I see in the work isn't really dynamic. It's just kind of really, it's like the background and the foreground, like there's a kind of a clear hierarchy. It's like the background is just the background. Um, and then there's like things on top of the poster, but Try to try to make it so that like the background is just as important as the foreground, mm -hmm. um, and maybe that might not be clear, but I th I think you'll know what I mean when when you start designing. Um, you know, I think when you see like those optical illusions, like oh, is this a vase or is it two people kissing? I think that's when it gets kind of interesting when you kind of have that figure ground ambiguity, and so figure ground ambiguity is one of the most important concepts when you're starting out in design. Um, and that's not the only way to design things. There are times where, again, you need that clear hierarchy between a background and a foreground. But I think this is that kind of type of design is something that Roland seems very comfortable with. I would say try to make things that, you know, really have a more dialogue between positive and negative space. Fantastic. Um, Roland's also asked, I mean, she's a great admirer of yours, <laughs> Eric. Um, and she specifically asked how you see her portfolio, I guess, in the context of, you know, say she was in applying to, to join your team. Um, are there any things that you would, you know, really encourage her to, to, I guess, develop a bit more and refine? Or, you know, what, what would you say if this, if this application came through this portfolio? Um, I think pretty much what I just said. I think mm -hmm. really beautiful composition in, in the book design layouts. Try to bring some of that energy to the to the rest of her work. Oops. <laughs> 
that is normally my that's my morning alarm <laughs> actually um but yeah i think you know i think i would just try to look for a little bit more variation in things i think um again it's relying on a lot it's relying on cool things to do a lot of the storytelling it's relying on a great illustration and a great typeface to tell a story um like but what would you do if you didn't have those things you know i mm -hmm. think like um and i would say that maybe as just advice in general um yeah i think i think just knowing when to give something breathing room i would say that would just be my advice from a designer standpoint i would say that maybe from a life career advice kind of standpoint um i think the work is a little bit too contemporary and again i think it's great to make work that's a reflection of now but you know, if, if you're a recent graduate and if you're out of school, I think it's the perfect time to, to look at outside sources besides what you know. Like, you know, look at look at old book design, look at a book that was made in the 1800s and see how they do their layouts and see if there's something that you could take from there, too. Um, I think I think if you look at most of the books in my library, like I think most of my most of the books that I really research a lot and I really take in was was made before the 1950s. Um, Right. I'm, I'm not really trying to look at like what other people are doing now necessarily. I, I mean, I can't not look at it, but I think where my most of my inspiration comes from is like, yeah, again, like 20, like mostly like 19th to 20th century um, typography and design. And it's like, I'm going to see contemporary design all around me. I'm going to take that in, but I'm, I'm, I'm where I really try to do my research and where I really try to understand my graphic design history is the things that are long gone. And I think you're gonna if you if you study more and have more scholarship in that area, you're gonna let those things kind of integrate into your work and tell stories for you. I would say like get out of looking at contemporary sculpture, get out of looking at contemporary painting, like look at historical works, look at different types of works, um, uh, and just have just just have a bit more diversity in where you're taking your inspiration from. Would be my advice. I think that's great advice and, and great advice to finish on. I'm afraid we're already past uh, the hour mark, so um, we're going to have to leave it there, Eric. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I, there are a couple of questions that have come through, particularly from Greg and, and Catherine on the chat in the, in the past couple of minutes. Um, unfortunately, we haven't had a chance to, to ask those, but um, don't, don't worry, Greg and Catherine, you will have a chance afterwards on the Discord um, chat. Um, but yeah, we've come to the end of our, our second edition of uh, the Nice Hour on Adobe Live. It's been a really genuinely very, very fascinating chat with Eric. And I think it's fair to say we've both been overwhelmed by uh, the quality we've seen in, in those portfolios, yeah. those five really portfolios. Really excellent work. Again, this is just me being really nitpicky at this point. <laughs> exactly. Really everyone up here, you know, cream of the crop of, of just like young contemporary designers. I'm, you know, absolutely impressed by everything. Um, again, like, I don't, think, I don't think anyone really knows what they're talking about. And, you know, you might see me walk back my advice like five years from now in my own work, but, you know, and what I'm seeing and what I'm reacting to, just a really great just energy that I feel from everybody. Really great point of views too. Absolutely. Um, and I guess, yeah, just a final thing, I guess to thank you very much for everyone who joined us today. Um, great to see so many kind of familiar names popping up in the chat and also some new ones as well. Um, a special thank you as well to those five uh, who submitted your portfolios. I hope you found the discussion of your work helpful, encouraging, inspiring, all of that stuff. Um, before Eric and I both head on over to the Discord channel to answer any remaining questions you guys have, I just want to say a final kind of colossal thank you um, to Eric for his time today and his fantastic advice, his constructive criticism um, and very, very helpful feedback. I hope everyone will agree that, um, yeah, it's been pretty amazing listening to your words of wisdom, Eric. <laughs> no, thank you. Um, you've, you've, you've been much too kind with your kind words to me. <laughs> today I don't think anyone said like some of the things you've said before so you know very flattered but again thank you to everyone that put their self out there you know I think that's the word that's where I really want to owe my thanks to you it's a very scary thing to, to have somebody say what do you think about my work and to do that on such a public platform it's, it's not easy at all and so you know for everyone that had the the courage to submit you're going to be all right because that's just the most important thing is like the desire to put yourself out there i've known so many talented designers who were so maybe afraid to put themselves out there that it really cost them their career so i think a lot of times we could wax about typography all day but really the most important step is to just put your putting yourself out there that's really what's going to open the doors for you so you you know even if 
even if I wasn't able to look at your work today, the fact that you submitted, again, that's that's what's going to separate you from 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 other people. And I think that's really just the most important first step. And that's not something I I did in most of my career too. That's something I've learned much later. Um, and no one's going to advocate for yourself as much as you do. And so you know, just definitely just keep that in mind and and be encouraged to kind of go forward with that. Fantastic. And, and yeah, that's, I mean, so, so true. Everyone who, who, whose work didn't get uh, discussed today, but who submitted, thank you as well. Yeah. Um, finally, very, very finally, uh, a big thank you to Adobe Live for hosting us today. We'll be back again at the same time on Monday next week um, when I'll be speaking to the amazing illustrator Carabo Poppy. So please do tune in again then uh, for the, the nice hour. Uh, until then, thank you all very much and uh, goodbye. Goodbye from me and goodbye from Eric. <laughs>